Well, as you can see, I'm collecting all the countries. If, if I'm invited back, I hope to have a few more attached to my name. So, wow, it's bright here. I have about eight and a half minutes of presentation. I'll try to slow it down a little um, since there's simultaneous translation. Uh, this is called The Elite We Need. Um, politics is not ultimately very important or not as important as it seems. It is at least not fundamentally important to our identity. Let me attempt to defend this. As one commentator has said, we have an elite problem. A smug political elite is pushing a globalist ideology with benefits to their own people that have long ago passed the point of diminishing returns. I shall assume that the members of this meeting broadly agree on the problems, some of which you've shared with one another today. So I'll proceed to offer three possible models of conserving the best of the West, both Christian and European, whilst remaining free both of the self-hatred infecting our political and intellectual class, and also free of the populist spirit of negation. All three models require elites. So, Brexit stuck one finger in the eye of the elite, and Trump seems to have blinded the other eye. What's next? Wilders as Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Le Pen in France, the breakup of the EU slowly but surely, a real populist revolt. The trend is, so it seems, against elites of a certain kind or stripe. Well, let's imagine a world without elites. Would this mean no real distinctions of education or achievement? Would this mean no concentrations of wealth or property? Would this mean a breakdown of inherited institutions of governance and culture? Would this mean no artists, scholars, priests, or politicians as a, an identifiable class? Would this mean fishing in the morning, poetry in the afternoon, and, well, you might see the implication. Populism is now tracking where Marxism has already tread. First we will destroy, and then we will see, as they said. They famously ask, what is to be done? Action is the only answer against the enemy. Thought, and especially political thought, is anathema. I consider political life without intellectual reflection to be undesirable and even dangerous. The whole point of political life is excellence, or the good life, as Aristotle said. Otherwise, why not stick just to one's own? We must discuss what the good life consists in in order to have it. Former communist countries are particularly susceptible to politics of action, or that promise action. Other, um, sorry. In many such countries, the earth was scorched by 20th century ideologies, and there is often little to conserve as conservatives try to. So one must act, I suppose. But populism in Western European countries, and especially in America, is also very pro-action and very anti-intellectual or anti-thought. There was no one less like a professor than Donald J. Trump or Bernie Sanders, for that matter. The temptation amongst contemporary populists, East or West, is to become a sort of revolutionary conservative, which should be a contradiction in terms. It's at least an ironical term. This is, in a way, a worse position than that of certain French revolutionists, for they at least had a plan. Again, it is more like many communist revolutionaries. Now, I don't want to engage in a politics of negation, so let's construct. The fight against political correctness cannot only be one of destroying bad institutions and practices. It needs to be constructive of alternatives to the inherited ideologies and corrupt institutions. It needs to do the hard work of building, and indeed the dirty work of determining a politics of the possible, rather than a politics of utopia or Arcadia. It needs to know what is possible and be able to communicate 
the whole vision as a believable story. Remember, it is much easier to destroy than it is to build. Many of you come from countries that need building up, literally, not only the actual infrastructure, which was destroyed during the 20th century, but the intellectual and cultural infrastructure as well. Donald Trump's victory might incline you to put too much energy into politics and law, seeing it perhaps as attainable, or perhaps Brexit does that. Politics and law, important as they are, are usually the result or the symptom rather than the cause or the disease. And they change, sometimes faster than the wind. So what should or where should the primary energy go then? I'll refer to three models of preserving or building our shared European and Christian identity, ordered from least to most effective as I see them. The first involves politics. These also apply to national or regional identities, and each requires the right kind of elites or a certain kind. I gave each a Greek name as a shorthand, Kairos, Logos, and Mythos. So, Kairos. Kairos utilizes the doers of purported goods at the right time, at appointed times, as the Greek word implies. It focuses on law and politics. Its elites are those in power or positions of influence. Kairos is the most short term of strategies, and <clears throat> it is better than a mere politics of action, for it does have a plan. But it often merely mimics the slash and burn strategies of revolutionaries, just toward different ends. And its work can be overturned with just one lost election, or, as the sad case in Poland, with one plane crash. Logos utilizes thinkers. Logos is the Greek word for word. Reason, understanding, logic, and so on. In our culture, it has an elevated status. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, St. John tells us. Logos involves all forms of knowledge, each operating in its natural place, some in everyday life, and others in special circumstances of science, religion, or the fine and practical arts. We are told that populism brings common sense against elite ideologies learned at the universities, and that's true. And common sense is good for common things. But so much of the world we benefit from is specific and specialized. It must be learned under careful study. This goes for practical things like politics and less practical things like philosophy and theology. Logos can benefit all, but not everyone is capable of handling such learning. So society must be prepared, if it wants to benefit from it, to support some who will be educated by way of others who will not be to a certain level. Those who learn must be instilled with a sense of noblesse oblige. The privilege of society-supported education implies a reciprocal duty to support the society that educates you, uh, chiefly by handing on the knowledge what traditio literally means to hand on in the Latin. We have it on reliable authority that we're supposed to be wise as snakes and innocent as doves. Unfortunately, contemporary populism often makes us innocent as snakes and wise as doves. But the world is ruled by ideas and little else as a poor economist but decent intellectual famously said. The knowers must be supported so that they are, we are wise in our action, we are wise in our kairos. And lastly, mythos. Mythos utilizes those who tell our story. When we are dead, they will only remember our stories, Flannery O'Connor said, the American short story and no writer and novelist. What else but the stories do we remember of Homer's age, or of the ancient Israelites, or of much of ancient Mesopotamia? Stories need storytellers. Poets, writers, singers of songs, those who make movies and television, filmmakers. The left has a near monopoly on this in most European countries, certainly in America. And the right does not put resources into allowing artists, and I mean broadly storytellers, <clears throat> to have the scole, the leisure, the time to do the difficult work of storytelling. 
Sharing stories allows us to have a shared history. It allows you and me to become and remain a we. Both communism and common sense populism that is popular in much of the West today are cut off from history because they tell the story from the present and often only in the present and deny the significance of time. History is meaningless if life is an eternal struggle of elites against the common man. Stories are generally told from the beginning to the end. From any one point, one does not know where he is in the story or even that he is in fact in a story unless someone tells him, someone who can recount how it began and how it might end. That takes a lot of careful thought and imagination, but the final product can be immensely influential. Flannery O'Connor also said, if we forget our past, we won't remember our future, and it's just as well, because we won't have one. Summing this up, Kairos is about elites who act now. This is the most ephemeral mode of preserving our identity, but it is necessary. And we can't get distracted by only focusing on it. Logos is about those who understand so that our actions can be wise, not only at the right time, but for the right reason, so that they can be virtuous. It must inform Kairos. And Mythos is about those and uses those who remember our identity for us, which is bound up in the stories and histories they tell. It gives Kairos and Logos their context and forms their boundaries. All three require elites that are supported by and, importantly, supportive of the societies that have helped to produce them. We need this elite, especially those who trade in stories, because without them, we cannot express just how we are a we. That is, besides shared blood and soil. Blood and soil are enough for animals to share an identity, but they're not sufficient for rational animals to do so. Thank you. <laughs>